So my first question would be who actually knows NXP? Ah, okay. <laughs> I was wondering. But so I quickly prepared some slides in the beginning. Uh, this was joint work with people from TU Graz. So Pascal, Robert, and Mario from Stefan Mangert's team. And from NXP there was Jan Hochebrügger and myself from the security concepts team. Okay, so yeah, I prepared some slides for NXP. From, about NXP, for those people who don't know it, uh, it's a semiconductor company, and it's, yeah, 30,000 employees worldwide. And, yeah, funny thing here is it says it has 60 years of history, but actually NXP was founded in 2006. It was the semiconductor division that was split off from Philips. And in 2017, I went through the site and I saw a poster saying, NXP technology brought the first man to the moon. And the story behind that is actually that in 2015, we merged with Freescale. That was the semiconductor division from Motorola, which actually made the chips for the Apollo mission. And so, yeah, that's why we have here 60 plus years. But also it means that we have a quite large product portfolio because of this merger. So that's what we do. But actually what you might know NXP for is MyFair. So if you use transportation in a contactless way, that's uh, based on MyFair often. And there we are in 750 cities. And also from credit cards, bank cards. So there is a high probability that your credit card has an NXP chip in it. And also keyless access to cars, for instance. And especially from those, uh, basically uh, products, that's why our security mindset comes from, because those are products, especially credit cards, passports, where you need certification. But on the other high-end scale, we also do the base chips for Alexa, for instance, or for routers, and yeah, also radar chips. And 14 years ago, we were doing mostly hardware, uh, but that changed. And by now, we are doing cloud services, firmware, obviously, and software for the products. Yeah. So that was shifting. OK, so that was NXP. Now, a bit about the organization I'm in. So there is a competence center, crypto and security. And that's a central security organization. And yeah, so there we do security architecture for the different projects. So basically, the business lines are our customers. Uh, we do certification, so with external labs for, for instance, passports and so on. Uh, security maturity, so actually having a process that people stick to the security, uh, well, policies that we have. And also part of that is BSIM that was mentioned in the morning. And then we have hardware IP and software IP teams that do the software crypto libraries or actually the crypto accelerators for our chips. And then there is the security concepts team, where I am in. And here we do, for instance, projects like uh, post-quantum crypto related, or security for machine learning, uh, runtime protection, like this what I'm presenting now, or also uh, protection, uh, platform resiliency. Like, what can I do if my platform is already hacked? How can I ensure that I always get it back, even if it's remote? OK, so that's it. Why did I say this? Uh, well, essentially, if that sounded interesting to you, please let me know, and I'm happy to ask questions, uh, to answer questions, of course. <laughs> so, and as you can see, locations might not be a problem. We are all over Europe with this organization. Okay, so now you know what NXP is about. This talk is about automated runtime protection for unsafe languages. Now, who of you is actually dealing with C a lot? Really? <laughs> OK. So there was one hand, uh, which is good, because it means you're probably using languages that are safe. And, but I hope you're curious enough to still learn about it. Uh, so this talk will, about, will be about tagged memory, uh, then cryptographically tagged memory as an optimization uh, approach. Yeah. And then I will conclude and give an outlook. So what is the motivation for all this? Already in the morning, we heard, um, well, 
there are tons of IoT devices. We want to give an IP to everything, and whatever these devices do, it will be more or less complicated. But there is one thing for sure, we need to care about the security. And, well, what if not? That depends on whom you ask. Marketers might tell you it's a big opportunity. Others might say the world is going to end. Well, that's not going to happen, but we still need to do something about it. And, okay. So, and now I again ran a bit into the pitfall that I come from a different community because, uh, yeah, here when I speak about remote attacks, I mean really you have an open port, for instance, and that service behind that port is having some memory vulnerability. So remote attacks, I usually mean that. And so these remote attacks, you usually know them from servers, NPCs, viruses, for instance, uh, but now they are more and more moving into the IoT world. Why? Because they're easy targets. Not only sometimes functionality is more important, uh, or very many other reasons that were mentioned already in the morning might be the cause of this, uh, but also the processors themselves might not be that capable. They might not have a memory management unit, for instance, that helps you. Okay, so then, Attack types uh, that we consider here are stack overflows um, or stack execution, actually. So you inject shell code and you execute it. And you might think this was stopped in 2004 when actually people introduced features in your memory management unit that said pages of memory can either be executed or they can be written, but not both. And it took a while, but actually nowadays it shouldn't be possible anymore that you inject uh, code on your stack and then you execute it. Except, of course, if a device doesn't have such features because it's a small IoT device. <clears throat> but these attacks should not be possible anymore, but then there came return-oriented programming. Um, yeah, does anybody actually is familiar with that? Okay, very good. Uh, so, and that's still pretty dominant. And then you have but there are countermeasures, and then you have more and more exotic variants like jump-oriented programming, data-oriented programming, and so on. Okay, but the conclusion is, yeah, so here we care about remote attacks, and if we don't, the consequences might be a denial of service of our devices only. That might be already annoying if it's your door lock, but it could be also building up botnets like in 2016, the mirror botnet that was built with IP cameras and or ransomware or spamming or you might even control a fleet of self-driving cars and bring down a city. I mean, just blocking the streets. Uh, yeah, and just ransomware. So that's a funnier but still annoying outcome that might happen. Okay, so until now, we settled that remote attacks are a problem. Uh, here in this figure, I tried to show how such attacks can actually go their way. So usually you start with some memory vulnerability. So somewhat some bug in your code allows you, allows you actually to write or read from a memory location where you're not supposed to write or read. And if you're just able to read from somewhere where you're not supposed to read from, okay, then you might end up this, so finding it, uh, ah, yeah. use for read access, and then you leak data, and you have an information leak. And that could be like the hard bleed bug of OpenSSL. <clears throat> but you could also try to write somewhere, then you go this path, and you try to modify code in RAM, and that should not be possible because you have this uh, write, XOR, execute flag in your MMU. But then, what usually people do, they try to modify code pointers, and then this code pointer suddenly points to shell code or a gadget, and then you could, could do return-oriented programming, for instance, and do control flow hijacking. Now, if you go this path, you have some things that might prevent it. For instance, Apple is by now using an ARM feature that is called code pointer integrity. So their code pointers are actually protected by Mac 
So a message authentication code. Uh, you have ASLR. There are different opinions about how uh, powerful that is on different platforms. And you have control flow integrity, although this is barely used. So for instance, Intel had a technology for this uh, based on FAT pointers years ago, but they stopped it again because nobody used it. OK, but the bottom line here is that all remote attacks start from a memory leak. And yes, you can do various different things here. But if you can solve the problem here, this is a huge step already. And here I have a small disclaimer. Here I say all remote attacks need a memory vulnerability. I'm sure there are tons of attacks that you are familiar with and I don't know of and that don't fall into this category. So, but, yeah. And then memory safety. And that's, there are two takeaways now. Memory safety. Uh, okay, first, well, you have use of the free and buffer overflows. Both are pro can be solved with memory safety. And strong memory safety is really costly. As I said before, the Intel approach was never taken up, even though everybody had it in its processor. And tech memory is one of the most promising approaches, and that's what I'm going to talk now about. OK. So first of all, small motivation for tech memory. Tech memory is not a new thing. It dates back to the 70s, and it actually means nothing else than just putting some metadata next to your data bird in memory. And back then, people used it for debugging, for instance, or just telling the uh, CPU what data they're dealing with. Is it an integer or a character? Uh, but you can also use it for security. And the simplest thing you can do is taint tracking. Now, for taint tracking, you only need one bit. So I try to kind of uh, depict this here. You have your data words in memory, and you have some user input and some function pointers. And next to each word, you have one bit. And here it says tainted, tainted, safe, and safe. And the point is, with taint tracking, you have a simple policy. Everything that comes from outside is per default tainted. You don't trust it. If you apply functions to your data, if you have a function on something safe and safe, it's safe. If it's tainted and tainted, obviously tainted. But if it's a function of something tainted and safe, it becomes tainted. And why do we do this? We want to avoid that we do control flow decisions based on tainted data. Um, OK, sounds good so far. The only problem is probably at some point you need to do this. Uh, for instance, you have a user input, and you want to dispatch that. So then you need to do some checks on your data and sanitize it to make it safe again. So that's one example, and that's on the very low cost side. On the other hand side, you can do uh, quite complicated things. For instance, uh, there is one, uh, sorry. Yeah, you can run your CPU on the one hand side, having your tagged memory and doing running your application. And on the other hand side, you could have a policy engine that is a CPU on its own that is constantly monitoring what the other one is doing. And based on rules, uh, policies, and the tags, is actually uh, making decisions whether it's OK or not. And, yeah, and then your function suddenly is slightly more complicated. And it's a function of the instruction, source tags, and destination tags. And so there is a cooperation between NXP and Dover Microsystems. And their solution is called CoreGuard. And that's really having next to your ARM chip an entire risk chip. And you have huge tags of well, between 16 and 32 bits, and you can implement arbitrary policies. So you can do taint tracking. You can do landing pads. So for instance, you're only allowed to instructions, which are actually marked as, as entry points to basic blocks, so functions, or subroutines. And you can also do memory coloring. OK, so until now, I told you that tagged memory is a promising solution. There are several things you can do with tagged memory. Next, we will look at what can you do with memory coloring. Why do we look also at memory coloring? Because it's also uh, 
it's, it's really uh, taking up momentum. So ARM is introducing this memory tagging extension, which is essentially uh, memory coloring. Spark has its ADI, which is the application data integrity extension that is also doing memory coloring. So people are really using it. Also, Google is uh, strongly pushing for it. So they started, I don't know if somebody is familiar with the LLVM address sanitizer. So this was kind of the first step. And now they did a hardware address sanitizer, which shows better performance. But they really are keen on now using this ARM extension. Um, yeah. OK. So memory coloring, how does it work? You have a 64-bit pointer. But usually, you only use maybe 48 or 56 bits for your virtual address space on a large platform. On smaller platforms, it might be even only 39 bits. So the rest of the bits you don't really need, so you could use it for something. And in our case, we will store there a tag or a color. And at the same time, we also tag our memory. So every data word in memory is tagged also with a color. And as you can see here, tagging the pointer is for free. Tagging the data is not. And then how it's used, if you dereference a pointer, you make sure that the tag in the pointer and the tag next to the data match. If yes, everything is OK. If not, you raise an exception. OK. Then, well, it's not really nice to store the tags next to your data because you completely mess up your memory layout. Um, so what you usually do is that you store your tags in a different data structure, like in a hash map. And then something in the background actually needs to make sure that together with the data, the tag is fetched from this hash map and it's matched. Um, usually, uh, granularities for the data words are 32 bits, 64 bits, or even larger. So on the ARM platform, you have between 16 bytes and 2 to the 11 bytes. Now, here's a bit of hardware. Now, usually what you have to speed up things, your core doesn't directly speak to your DRAM. <clears throat> you have caches in between. And so you have usually your data cache, L1, and L1 instruction cache. And here you have latencies of usually one or two cycles. And then, yeah. You have your L2 cache, which is considerably larger. Um, and usually that one, or even the L3, might be connected to DRAM. Now, if you want to have tagged memory, we need this tag cache in between, because we have our data and the tags stored in different places in DRAM. Now, every time the CPU requests data uh, from the DRAM, you first check if the tag is available already. And if not, you first fetch the tag put it in a tag cache, then you fetch the data, and then you slice those two. So then in L2, already the data and the tag, they are interleaved. So then you can nicely work with it. And in, in data cache, you also do this. Instruction cache is usually not tagged. Um, OK. But what you can also see, the annoying thing that now is that you have this extra DRAM traffic, because you need to get in your tags. And that's kind of expensive. And OK. And, and either you have a lot of extra DRAM traffic, or you make your data cache huge, and then you have less DRAM traffic. But there is always something to pay. OK, so how does a programmer deal with this? Uh, a pointer needs to be tagged in its most significant bits. Working with pointers doesn't really change. The tags are just copied over or inherited if you derive one pointer from another. Um, OK, then, but then you already have a problem because now you have your pointer tagged, but the memory isn't yet. So if you start accessing your memory, you get immediately an exception. So you need special instructions in the hardware that actually allow you to tag memory or to untag memory when you do allocation or deallocation. And how this could look now in a malloc and free wrapper is depicted here. So 
Here you need to assign random tags and the reason, okay, I will explain later why random. Then here you need to tag your memory and then you just return the pointer. So everything else is like in usual malloc. And for free, you just clear the tag, then you get actually the actually allocated size and then you just untag your memory and free the memory. And here this is how, well, depending on your allocator, but with the standard allocator, that's how your memory look li looks like. You have the user data and in between you have administer administrative data used by malloc. Okay. So now you learned everything you need to know about tagged memory. Uh, I will just quickly sum up the properties. The tags are always chosen randomly and the reason why is because it's otherwise hard to actually know what, what should I do. I mean, you can actually, maybe you, if you have two neighbors, you can make sure that they don't have the same color. But if you have dynamic memory allocation, it becomes really expensive to always check that you don't have the same colors as neighbors. So you take that into account and you don't care about that. You simply take random tags and that's also what we see that ARM is doing and that Spark is doing. We already saw we have uh, extra RAM traffic and we can mitigate that with large tag caches. But in order to get somewhere in the single digit percentage with our overhead uh, of the RAM traffic, we need eight times as many entries in the tag cache as we have in the data cache. And even if we have only small tag sizes, like also ARM and Spark are using only four bits, exactly for this very reason that it becomes expensive. Even then, here we already have a tag cache that is half as big as our data cache. And if you say four bits are not good enough, we want to have larger tags for better security, then it might even become bigger than our actual data cache. Okay, so what does it mean for the attacker? An attacker succeeds with a probability of 1 over 16 because we have four bits of text and there is a high chance that he will actually have just by chance the right tag when he accesses memory he's not supposed to access. But it works for attack uh, prevention and more important, it works for bug detection because if you roll this out in the field, you will uh, quickly get feedback about bugs in your code. So if you can, use it. And I will at the last slide summarize things that are actually already implementing this or coming close to it. And as for now, this also means if you can afford the OAD. So now, CTM, cryptographically tagged memory. And uh, now let's come to the actual core of this work. We wanted to come up with something where we can actually avoid the whole RAM traffic overhead. And we didn't want to store the tags in RAM. And we also were not satisfied with only four bits because of the low security. So how can we do better? And yeah, so that's what I just said. So I, theoretically this should be possible because we often only use my, uh, much fewer bits, like only 39, so we could theoretically use tags of 25 bits. Okay, and so the people from, so what we did, we, we actually uh, did the LLVM support. So LLVM is a well, compiler that supports many languages and compiles down to a machine code for all different architectures. Uh, and then the guys from TL Graz, they did an FPGA implementation. Uh, and in the end, we were running Linux on it to do the benchmarking. And all this was done on a RISC-V rocket core. Okay, so one more ingredient that we will need, uh, low latency tweakable block ciphers. Uh, we already heard before about block ciphers running in CPC mode. So low latency cipher here means uh, we want to have something that runs, finishes in one to two machine cycles. Usually, uh, if you think about Intel uh, special AS instructions, you have 10 to 12 instructions for one block. So with these low latency ciphers, you can reduce that. And that's important because 
We don't want these extra cycles when we access RAM. And the second ingredient, we want not a standard block cipher, but a tweakable one. What this means is simply that a tweakable block cipher has one additional input next to the key. And in theory, that tweak changes the algorithm completely. Yeah. In theory, it's just, yeah, you just feed it in into your gates. Um, OK, what else? Yeah. And one example of something like that is Karma, for instance. That's a Qualcomm design that is actually uh, used in the ARM chips yeah. for this uh, point integrity. OK. So what do we do for cryptographically tagged memory? We have the same setup again. We have our tagged pointers. But now we don't store the tags in RAM. But we simply use the tag as this tag uh, tweak input for the tweakable block cipher. And when we want to store something in RAM, we just encrypt it with a key, take the tag, and use this to encrypt it. OK? So what happens is if we access something in RAM with the correct tag, we decrypt it correctly. If we use the wrong tag, we receive garbage. And also, as a kind of implementation detail, what we did, if we have a zero tag or the all one tag, then we don't encrypt. OK, well how could this look in a simple architecture? Um, just go over here again. If you have a pointer with a tag, tag uh, and you request it from the CPU, then it well, let's assume it's not cached yet, so you get a cache miss. So you will not fetch it from DRAM, and then you decrypt it using this tag value that was actually in the pointer. And you store it in your cache line. And along with the data, you store in this T field the tag that was originally in the pointer. And then you forward it to the CPU, and everything is fine. If you evict the cache line, so if it needs to be written back because the space is needed in the cache, then you simply use this T to encrypt it and store it in DRAM. Now, if the CPU tries to access something with a wrong tag that is already cached, you check if tag matches T, and if not, you raise an exception. So this sounds all easy. Are we done? No. Because there is something like prefetching. So, Usually, in larger systems, you have 64-byte cache lines. And one machine word nowadays is eight bytes. <clears throat> so you have eight of these machine words in one cache line. And if you access the first one with the CPU, let's say that's word three, then it's delivered to the CPU. But at the same time, in the cache subsystem, it starts fetching all the other entries in the cache line because it assumes they will be needed soon. Now, if we do this, um, we might be lucky, and all the adjacent words might have used the same tag. But if you're not, then we decrypt something with the wrong tag, and then these words here will just contain garbage. And even worse, they will have the wrong tag value, T values, so when we access them, we will get an exception. So we cannot really use exceptions. And the same holds for speculative execution. If the CPU runs a loop longer than it actually should, because it thinks, yes, we will do another iteration, then the pointer also goes out of bounds, which is OK, because at some point the CPU will realize, OK, that was not the right thing to do. Let's just throw everything away. But at that point, again, in the cache, it will be already decrypted as garbage. Um, OK, something popped up. Good. So we cannot really use exceptions because, same as in the talk before, we had no redundancy that told us whether the decryption was correct or not. So either we add redundancy or we just live with it. And we say, let's do this probabilistic approach. 
What does it mean? Whenever we have tag not equal to t, we just treat it as a cache miss and we just re-decrypt it from memory. And for code pointers, this is probably okay in a 64-bit space because if you decrypt garbage, then your 64-bit pointer will just go into Nirvana and you will have a segmentation violation. So if somebody tries to attack your application, it will crash. Uh, for integers and booleans, that's a different story and that's problematic because, well, a boolean, or if you interpret garbage as a boolean, it's true. Yeah. So, okay. But you could actually, I mean, you could tell the compiler, at least for instance in C++, that's a boolean and let's do some, you could use some uh, redundancy to store it and then the compiler can introduce some checks. So you could deal with that. Okay, then is prefetching and speculative execution a performance problem? Because you might think if you constantly need to refetch something uh, that costs, but actually it doesn't because it, it rarely happens. And also we usually have now this memory fragmentation. So you allocate more memory than you need. So then within a cache line you have fewer different tags. And also there is related research by Google that showed actually that if you do memory tagging, then 16 bytes seems to be a good granularity and it gives you quite little overhead in terms of RAM usage. So 0 to 6% for the heap and up to 9 for the stack. Okay, but now it's all fine. We don't have this extra RAM traffic. We can use large tags that give us good security, but if you look at the numbers, we are in the single higher single digit performance overhead. And that is something that is not acceptable. I mean, it's acceptable for security people, but you will not be able to convince your manager or your business line that they build it into a product. It just doesn't work. Um, so, okay. That's a bit of a problem. And, but essentially the only overhead comes from the encryption so what can you do about that? And the cool thing is that many systems actually already have memory encryption inside. Uh, Intel has a technology for that. AMD has a technology for that. That your RAM content is just encrypted. And that makes sense because there are, for instance, cold boot attacks or other things where people can get hold of your memory content and read it. So, and if you have already a memory encryption system, then you can combine it with our scheme. You just need to exchange the block cipher with a tweakable block cipher, and you need to extend your caches, obviously, to support tags. <clears throat> but if you do that, it turns out your overhead in performance and in hardware is both less than 1%. So that's quite nice. Then you could again complain and say yes, but uh, it's still probabilistic only. Uh, and that might not suit everybody. And I accept that. Because, yeah, I mean, if somebody hears yes, but you can't protect booleans and integer, that might still be dangerous. Uh, in practice, you need to look at the case if that's really the case, but yeah, it's not nice. So, but there is also, as again we heard in the talk before, authenticated encryption. And again, there are systems that use this. For, inter for instance, Intel SGX, you has authenticated memory. And if you combine this with our scheme, then again, the overhead stays the same, but now you can actually have decryption errors and you can use exceptions. So now it's not probabilistic anymore, but still you have this large tag size, uh, which I actually say here probably, yeah. <laughs> large tag size, so now in this combination it's really strictly stronger than tagged memory. Um, yeah. In the implementation, we used Karma for memory encryption only, and for authenticated encryption, uh, we used ASCON, which is also uh, part of the CISA challenge. Okay, um, yeah, so that's it. That's already, already said that. Yeah, uh, that was my conclusion for the talk. Takeaways, um, yeah. What can you do in practice about it? I mean, this is nothing you can put your hands on already. But there are 
address sanitizers already available that you can compile your software with. Okay, it will be much slower, but at least for testing, probably people will do that anyway. And uh, maybe your software even allows you to run that in production with those sanitizers. And then the hardware address sanitizers that are slightly uh, faster, but those exist only on ARM. And so that's also a project of Google. And then you have the ARM memory tagging extension uh, authenticate, point authentication, Intel CET. So those are all technologies that help you make your code safer. They are out there, but they are rarely used. Yeah. And yeah, you need to recompile your library, so that's annoying, but okay, there's always a price. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Marcel, for this great talk. We have a couple of questions from the audience. I'm going to start with one that sums up some of the next ones as well. Do I need to consider these problems when I use a language with automatic memory management? Uh, no. I mean, <laughs> there is a gap. Um, yeah, if, if you write something in Java, then your virtual machine can use this technology. Uh, but in your Java code itself, you don't. It's kind of disconnected. Yeah, but yeah, for the for the virtual machine, you can use. So, for example, using Rust is that enough? If I'm on Rust, I'm okay. Um, I wouldn't say now that I'm completely familiar with it, but um, yeah, actually, I missed the background of Rust now. Okay. But I let's try to rephrase it. If it's uh, again a virtual machine running in the background then not. If it's a completely safe language that is compiled down to machine code, uh, then all these things are already in there, but the problem is it's much, much slower than C. If you can actually live with this overhead, yeah, then you're fine. But if you need to write low-level code or performance code or real-time code, uh, then you probably will not use Rust. Yeah. So I think there is, you can use pointer arithmetics in Rust if you want to, so your potentially unsafe depends on how you use it as far as Yeah, but then you have the problem again. Yeah. Um, is there a standard for memory tagging or are different processor vendors implementing it differently? Yes, <laughs> the, le the latter one. Uh, so there is not really a standard. I mean, for instance, uh, for Spark, they're, well, they just implemented it, and they ship uh, malloc uh, memory allocation libraries with it. So if you link to those libraries, then your actual allocator will be replaced, and then for the heap, you will use this technology. Uh, ARM implements it in their own way, and those two are actually the only two that I know of that are doing this. <clears throat> but anyway, as an implementer, I mean, maybe this didn't, I didn't really convey this message, but you don't need to know about this as an implementer. If you program C, you don't care about it. It needs to be in your compiler. And then it's all transparent. Yeah. Are we going to see this in the next couple of years in the compilers, you think? Uh, the ARM stuff, definitely. Yeah. OK. Uh, there was a question regarding the and keys. Maybe there. Uh, so it has been in version 8.5. And Apple is. So if you have odd version numbers, then those are for architectural licenses. So from ARM, you only get a spec, and you need to do the entire processor yourself, but Apple is doing that. And they are actually implementing this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. For others that are not implementing their ARM cores themselves, they have to wait a bit longer. OK. Uh, there was a question regarding the keys. Uh, where is the key stored, and how is it generated? So it's generated at boot up. Uh, depending what you have. I mean, in a system, you would usually have, so in, in a big SOC, you would have a security subsystem that would have a true random number generator, and you could convey uh, a random key into the core and store it there. And in RISC, you have these special registers, and we used two of those to store a 128-bit key. Okay. Uh, on the FPGA, actually, we used a pseudo-random key, but yeah, that was a proof of concept. 
Last two questions. Um, why not use just a cryptographic Mac instead of encryption? Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, so in the second example, hmm. so the point is, if you use a cryptographic Mac, you again have the Mac itself, which you need to store along. So it, you have a lot of overhead. And in the second example that I gave, where you have authenticated encryption, that's actually encryption together with a Mac. So there it's used. But uh, the reason is why we used encryption in the first place, because we didn't want this extra overhead in RAM. OK. So if that question was not, uh, if that was not a question, just approach the speaker afterwards and, and talk to him. He's going to stick around for a while, I hope. Yep. Cool. Um, one last question we have. Do you have hardware without spectra meltdown or similar problems? Say again? Do you have hardware without spectra meltdown or similar problems? So hardware where we don't have these problems. Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, actually, all the M cores, ARM M cores, don't uh, care much about this. And also for only a few ARM cores, uh, those problems apply. Okay. It's, yeah. So, thank you, Marcel. Yeah. Thanks.